Hello, my name is Anna. I am an education coordinator with the BC Center on Substance Use. Thank you for joining our session today. Today we are sharing an overview of the Sufentanil pres prescribed safer supply protocol with consideration for the off-label use of Sufentanil to reduce unregulated fentanyl use and associated harms. I will introduce you to our speakers in a moment, but first, before we get started, I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we are hosting this session is the unceded traditional homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. At the BCCSU, we recognize that the ongoing criminalization, institutionalization, and discrimination against people who use drugs disproportionately harm Indigenous people, and that continuous efforts are needed to dismantle colonial systems of oppression. We see our work as connected to these efforts, and we hope that our work contributes to an addiction system that provides safe, respectful, and evidence-based care. So with that, I will pass you off to our first speaker, Dr. Kelsey Roden, to introduce yourself. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, I'm Kelsey Roden. I'm the speaker for today's presentation uh, for the first part, and then we'll hear from Sarah towards the end. Uh, I am a family doctor here in Victoria. I finished the BCCSU, BCCSU Addiction Medicine Fellowship in June of 2020, and I've been working primarily in addiction medicine since then. Within that work, most relevant to this presentation is uh, I am a prescriber for Safer Victoria, and we've been doing sufentanil prescribing for the last two years. Uh, I do not have any commercial interests and no conflicts of interest to declare, and Sarah, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Sarah Foster. I'm the nurse manager for research development policy and innovation at PHS Community Services Society. And I helped develop the policies that we use for SAFER in Vancouver. And I also have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. All right, Kelsey, you can get started. Great. Uh, so we'll just start by talking about learning objectives. Um, by the end of the session, you should be able to describe the background and context of sufentanil as prescribed safer supply. You'll be able to identify who might be a good candidate for sufentanil, and we'll discuss how sufentanil is initiated, administered, and accessed. We'll talk about the role of prescribers, nurses, program directors, pharmacists, peer support staff, and outreach workers in sufentanil programs, and we'll compare the various service delivery models and operational logistics. Here's the agenda for today, and I'll let you have a quick look at that before we move on. And for introduction, this is based out of the provincial policy direction, which was published in 2021 to enable access to prescribed safer supply in BC. So this is a harm reduction intervention measure to reduce reliance on the toxic unregulated opioid supply among people at high risk of drug poisoning death in BC. This provisional, uh, Provincial Sufentanil Provisional Protocol provides a standardized pathway for providing Sufentanil. So why Sufentanil? It is available in multiple routes, which makes it really uh, a good option for many patients. Uh, so it can be offered sublingually, intramuscularly, or IV. Sufentanil provision can be added to a variety of existing programs and services, including OAT treatment with either methadone or KDN, sorry, at slow release oral morphine. It can also be added to injectable opioid agonist treatment, and it can be used within the context of overdose prevention or supervised consumption sites. Of note, providing sufentanil to reduce harms is not an evidence-based intervention, so we don't have evidence regarding safety data or established best practices at this point in time. However, prescribing sufentanil has been done in three pro programmatic settings in BC, uh, through PHS, AVI Health Community Services, uh, and Insight Supervised Consumption Site. Evaluation of this intervention is currently underway at these locations. The Sufentanil Protocol is informed by current clinical practice and emerging evidence to provide considerations and guidance for off-label use of Sufentanil to reduce unregulated fentanyl use and associated harms. Sufentanil can be offered as an as-needed or PRN program. The program depends on the participant's desired dose and the hours of operation at the site where they're accessing it. All doses are prescribed and administered as daily witness ingestion, and we'll talk more about dosing in the next few slides. Regarding eligibility, 
people who are eligible are those with an active opioid use disorder and ongoing active unregulated fentanyl use. For the injection route, the participant has to have ongoing injection fentanyl use. Participants would be considered at high risk of overdose, injection related harms, and other harms related to unregulated opioid use. There are some individuals who have not been diagnosed with an opioid use disorder, but who do use unregulated fentanyl that would benefit from accessing safer supply. And the Sioux Fentanyl Program could be appropriate for these individuals based on clinical judgment and individual circumstances. It is not a requirement for individuals to have trialed OAT to be considered for the Sioux Fentanyl Program. However, prescribers should explore all options with participants, including evidence-based pharmacotherapy and psychosocial treatments and supports. Contraindications to the Sufentanil program would include no history of opioid use or opioid non-tolerance as evidenced by things such as a negative urine drug test, no past history of OAT, and no documentation of witness consumption. Contraindications also include opioid use disorder but without fentanyl use, any hypersensitivity to ingredients in the formulation, any conditions that would preclude safe participation, examples being acute respiratory depression, severe acute head injury, or current or recent MAOI uh, medications. Other contraindications include inability to provide informed consent, and pregnancy is considered a contraindication. However, there are exceptional circumstances in which intervention would be appropriate for a pregnant person. And if this is being considered, a two prescriber review is highly recommended, one of whom should be a perinatal addiction specialist. Some precautions for prescribing would include youth who are 19 years of age or younger, active use of benzodiazepines, alcohol, or other CNS depressants, and note that benzodiazepine use could be intentional or unintentional. Use of alcohol and benzos should not result in automatic disqualification, but it should prompt further assessment. Certain ARV medications would be considered an area of precaution, and we'll talk about that. Caution should also be used if the participant is on other medications that have some drug interactions. And again, we'll talk briefly about that in the next couple slides. And then other considerations would be frailty. And clinicians could use the clinical frailty scale to try and assess this and see if a person would be appropriate or not. And lastly, participants who are driving a vehicle or have operating heavy machinery should not be doing so during initiation or dose increases. Here's a list of common medications which do have drug interactions with fentanyl products, including sufentanil. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them here, but know that there is a detailed list on the protocol, which you can refer to, and I would encourage any prescribers whose uh, participants that they're considering for the program are on these medications to have a look through the protocol and see uh, what precautions and, and monitoring parameters should be done. Uh, any individuals on these medications should just be monitored more carefully. And we'll move on to the next slide. There are special considerations for some ARVs, specifically cobacista and ritonavir. This can lead to significant increases in sufentanil serum levels. So in such situations, it's encouraged to just slowly titrate uh, the participants and monitor closely for sedation. Participants who are frequently on and off their ARVs would not be recommended to be on the sufentanil program because their serum levels are less predictable. And if there is any consideration for changing an HIV or an ARV regimen, an HIV specialist should be involved in those decisions. Sufentanil does not require special authority coverage, so it is part of Pharmacare and covered under Plan G, Plan C, and Plan W. Before administering the first dose, prescribers should go through the pre-initiation checklist. This includes discussion and documentation of informed consent. The discussion should include potential risks and benefits of prescribed sufentanil as safer supply, as well as a discussion about the absence of evidence and excuse me, supporting this approach, and a discussion of continuing care and harm reduction education. Prescribers need to confirm eligibility and coverage and complete the pre-initiation checklist, although this checklist itself can be done either by the prescriber or a non-prescriber who's a regulated health professional working within their scope. And it's important to include before starting doses, a discussion with a participant about their goals and, and help deciding a care plan and how to tell if they're benefiting from the program. It's recommended to have two prescriber approval. One prescriber would usually conduct the intake while the second prescriber reviews the chart and signs off on the initiation. This can help ensure participant safety. 
The two prescriber approval system, though, might not be possible in all treatment centers, and it should not be it should not cause delay in initiation. For any participants who are under 19 years of age, two prescriber approval would definitely be strongly recommended. And if in your local area, area a two prescriber approval system is not possible, you can always rely on the 24 seven BCCSU line uh, for assistance and further recommendations. Regarding dosing, sufentanil can be offered as as needed PRN program. The dose range is between 50 to 250 micrograms via SL, IM, or IV routes. It's offered every hour as needed up to the participant's desired dose or as hours of operation allow. Before the first dose, the participant has to choose their route of administration. Then the initial test dose is 50 micrograms via whatever route they've opted for. The test dose is then followed by a 10 minute post dose observation period. After this period, the sedation, sedation scale is measured for the participant. And it's usually measured using the safer sedation scale, which we'll show in the next couple slides. If the participant has a score greater than two, then they're not eligible for the program. But if there's no sedation, the participant may access additional doses of 50 micrograms if they desire it, followed by another 10 minute post dose observation. And then this participant may continue on 50 micrograms Q1H PRN or increase to 100 micrograms by the same dosing frequency, depending on their reaction. The prescriber can review and write an ongoing prescription. This is what the safer sedation scale looks like. As you can see here, scores of three or more would preclude the person from continuing with doses, but if they score two or less, then they are eligible to continue. If the participant experiences withdrawal or ongoing cravings at either the 50 or 100 microgram doses, then they can continue to increase by 50 micrograms each subsequent dose to a max of 250 micrograms, as long as they received a dose within the past seven days. And I would note that the max of 250 micrograms is based on clinical experience of uh, safety from an injection standpoint and volume of injection, as well as logistically being able to dissolve that volume under a person's tongue. Each dose does require a 10 minute post dose observation period. And if the safer sedation scale is greater than two after 10 minutes, then again, they're not eligible for further increases. The doses are not required to be consecutive to continue titration. So here's an example of a person's titration scenario. This patient, Alex, receives 100 micrograms via IM administration, tolerates the dose well, but does not return for a dose, additional doses on the same day. So they present the next day and request a 50 microgram increase. So the nurse at that point can administer 150 micrograms because it's been less than a week since their last dose and follow this by a 10 minute post-dose observation. Once a participant titrates to a comfortable dose or they reach the max of 250, the prescriber should review and write an ongoing prescription for the participant's set dose. Once the dose is set, the participant cannot increase the dose without a new order from the prescriber, even if it's below the maximum. Regarding routes of administration, participants have the option to switch routes of administration. So participants who are on sublingual or IM administration who would like to switch to IV must have 10 minute post-dose observation periods at the same dose to ensure they can tolerate the IV dose. However, if they're switching to, from IV to IM or SL, then no post-dose observation is required. Regarding missed dose protocols uh, for extended absence or for extended absence, clinicians should assess participants for recent substance use when they have missed doses. So if they are between the seven to 29 days of missed doses with ongoing unregulated opioid use, they can administer the last dose given in, with a 10 minute post-dose observation. Within that time frame, if it's a seven to 10 days of missed doses without ongoing unregulated opioid use, they can administer the last dose given with 10 minute post-dose observation. And for the 11 to 29 days of missed doses without ongoing unregulated use, they also need to reassess the participant, including treatment goals and program engagement. For 30 or more days of missed doses, a reassessment is required. If no unregulated use is present, they have to restart the program at initiation. But if unregulated opioid use is present, you could restart the program with the test dose and a 10 minute post dose observation. And then pharmacies will require orders from the prescriber to restart the prescription. Regarding initial and ongoing assessments, the initial assessment should be performed and documented prior to starting the program. 
The assessment may be completed by the prescriber or a regulated health professional working within their scope. Prescribers should be consulted though if there are any concerns raised by the initial assessment. Both initial and ongoing assessments should include subjective and objective measures. Subjective measures including how well the current treatment is supporting the patient's goals, substance use since last visit, any overdoses, etc. Objective measures would include their general appearance, signs of intoxication, uh, altered levels of consciousness, pupils, weight, urine drug screen, etc. Ongoing assessment should occur approximately every two months. Assessment of clinical and psychosocial indicators, as well as participant goals, should be performed to determine if the participant is benefiting. If the participant is not benefiting from the, from the intervention, then clinical judgment should guide the treatment plan, and adjustments could include things like increasing the sufentanil dose, co-prescribing opioid agonist therapy, or increasing their O dose, increasing psychosocial supports, or perhaps stopping the intervention. Pre- and post-dose assessments should both include subjective and objective measures. So pre-dose assessments would be subjective measures such as uh, how the last dose was and how they tolerated it, objective measures including the safer sedation scale. Post-dose assessments would include those things as well as the dose and time of administration and when the next dose is due. Sometimes medications do need to be held and if this is the case, it's important to document clearly the context and the actions taken. If the participant is too sedated or intoxicated based on the pre-dose assessment, they could be asked to return in a few hours for reassessment, and this should be explained clearly and documented. If this happens, education regarding the risks, risks of combining sufentanil with other medications or unregulated substances should also be offered. There are times where oral OAT doses will be held or adjusted for reassessment depending on the guideline for clinical management of opioid use disorder, which BCCSU has already published. At times, this program would need to be discontinued. Participants might choose to discontinue sufentanil to transition to oral OAT or other treatments. Opioid agonist treatment should follow the, pro should follow the protocols based out in the BCCSU uh, clinical guideline for clinical management. During OAT titration, sufentanil can be tapered or outright discontinued depending on the participant's discretion if cravings and withdrawal symptoms are adequately managed. Participants could be discharged from the program due to repeated diversion as well. Individuals who are on sufentanil alone and are discharged from the program should be offered a standard oral OAT titration. Individuals who are on both sufentanil and OAT and are discharged from the program should be continued on their OAT dose and this dose might need to be adjusted as well. Urine drug testing should be done or at least offered within the first two weeks of starting the program, although this could be waived based on clinical discretion if the participant is well known to the clinician, the staff, or the program, if there is objective evidence of fentanyl use otherwise, if there's sufficient collateral information, and then if the decision to waive the UDT is made, then it should be documented. Participants should provide a UDT about every two months for ongoing monitoring. A UDT should be done for participants who have been away from the program for more than 30 days to help confirm ongoing tolerance. The positive U or a positive UDT for other substances is not a reason to discharge a participant from the program as they could be experiencing other benefits such as decreased use, oat titrations, housing stability, or other markers of psychosocial benefit. Confirmatory testing on UDTs should be done testing for benzos and specifically atizolam, as this can provide additional information and education for the patient and staff. Okay, at this point in time, I'll pass it over to Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Kelsey. So for assessment, continuing care and program evaluation. Next. So clinical experience has found that it takes on average three to six months to determine if a participant is benefiting from the sufentanil program. Example indicators that the participant is benefiting may include reduced substance use, reduced reliance on the unregulated drug supply, and reduced visits to the emergency department. Example clinical indicators that the participant is not benefiting from this intervention include no change or an increase in substance use, no change or an increase in the reliance on the unregulated drug supply, and no change or an increase in emergency department visits. 
Example psychosocial indicators that the participant is benefiting may include gaining employment, reconnecting with family and friends, and attaining housing. And if they are not benefiting, they will maybe have no change in employment, no change in reconnecting with family and friends, and no change or a loss of safe housing. Program evaluation measures that can be used to help assess benefit include amount and frequency of substance use, frequency of drug poisonings, frequency of emergency department visits, severity of cravings and withdrawal symptoms, urine drug test results, and participant self-report. Service delivery models. So service delivery models should take into account Resource availability, local engagement, consultation with people who use drugs, local cultural practices, and program-specific strengths and constraints. Innovative approaches and considerations are needed, particularly to support rural and remote areas. Examples include clinic and site exclusive models, mixed clinic and site models, and community pharmacy mixed clinic and outreach models. This list is not exhaustive, but a prompt to tailor programs to fit a community's unique needs. Sites that offer supervised consumption services, overdose prevention services, IOT or TIOT, tablet injectable opioid agonist treatment are best suited to offer this program. Program operations will depend on resources, prescribers and nurses. Programs are encouraged to build clinic flow and program specific protocols based on staffing available. The role of healthcare providers. There are multiple roles for prescribers in the Sufentanil programs. These roles include, but are not limited to the following. Prescribers approve participants to enter the program. A two prescriber approval system is highly recommended. Prescribers conduct a pre-initiation assessment and ongoing clinical monitoring. Prescribers write prescriptions for participants which must specify the route of administration on the prescription. Prescribers provide a new order for dose adjustments if a participant experiences sedation and dose increases if a person stops titration before reaching the maximum dose. Nurses have multiple roles in the program, including, but not limited to, pre-initiation assessments, pre- and post-dose monitoring, and ongoing clinical monitoring. Titration and maintenance doses must be administered by nurses. Registered nurses and registered psychiatric nurses may administer the IM or IV injections with a client-specific order from an authorized health professional. Licensed practical nurses may administer IM injections, but not IV, with a client-specific order. Nurses may assist with landmarking, finding a vein, and stabilizing to support self-injections. And it's important to offer education on the risks of injecting and strategies to minimize these risks. Pharmacists and pharmacy staff play an integral role in the supply, delivery, monitoring, and reporting of medication, including contacting the prescriber if a participant has an extended absence from the program and wants to restart. Thanks, Sarah. So to gain some perspective on participant experience of soup fentanyl as prescribed safer supply, um, we interviewed a few folks at a local program who are offering this intervention. The first question we asked was, did you notice any immediate benefits to being on soup fentanyl as prescribed safer supply? A participant answered, as opposed to what I was doing on the street, 100%, I cut my using. Um, somebody else stated, I'm not a young man anymore, and the grind of hustling up money to support a habit, I was just getting tired. And so the stability of not worrying about having to grind up the money to make sure that you are all right was a huge relief. Um, we also asked um, participants, uh, what were some of the challenges to being on Sufentanil as prescribed safer supply? One participant answered, I missed it one day because I also have other things to do and being tied to here, the site is tough. Um, somebody also stated one of the challenges being, um, it hurts because of the size of the barrel and amount of liquid. Like I said, I'm not a big man. It just bruises me up. And once in a while I would IV it too. That was hard too with the size and the big barrels are quite stiff. I would get them, nurses, to split the doses into three, three mil barrels as opposed to five mil, but it was 12 needles a day. Um, so as we can see, there are some benefits and also challenges to this intervention. Um, and I just wanna thank you all for attending. Um, here are a list of resources. We will be releasing um, accompanying this webinar, the Provincial Sufentanil Provision Protocol. 
as well. Um, late summer, early fall, we will be releasing an updated guideline for the clinical management of opioid use disorder. And you can also visit our website to view a urine drug screen testing in patients prescribed opioid agonist treatment. In addition to that, um, if you're providing addiction and substance use care and require additional specialist support, the BCCSU offers an addiction medicine clinician support line. Um, this line is available 24-7, 365 days a year, and it will connect you with an expert in addiction medicine who can help with any challenging situations that you may come across in your practice. Feel free to access it using the phone number on this slide. And for any more information on this or to view any of our other resources, please visit the BCCSU website. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you got a lot out of this session. Take care.